Thank you guys very much, and thank you, DevOps Days Austin, for having me here. I am s very, very excited. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Woo. Hey, I, I, used, I used to work at Chef. I'm all about the hug ops. <laughs> so thank you, DevOps Days Austin, for having me here. I am very excited to share with you a little story. Um, actually, I, I'd love to share with you the whole story, uh, but I, I can, I've got time to share some bits and bytes of the story of moving from box software to a cloud service. And uh, it, I think it's a pretty uh, quintessential DevOps tale. And the story we're going to tell today is how we went from box software, from Visual Studio Team Foundation Server 2010, out to being a cloud service of VSTS. So we're not going to, I'm not going to be talking anything about capabilities of VSTS or anything like that. This is about the story of moving from this piece of box software that ran on one or a couple of Windows servers to becoming a cloud service that now supports all of Microsoft engineering as well as you know, thousands of customers and is you know, up and running and has some great documentation as far as what they did to get there. So when they, went, when they had the idea to run you know, TFS as a service, one of the first things that they had to do was actually stand up a cloud service, a public, uh, public instance of this. And the way TFS existed then was that there was a single instance. It was just one, one basically service instance. There, uh, they had you know, a couple of different layers and things like that. But there was no concept of multi-tenancy. There was no concept of multi-instance, right? And just about everything in TFS got stored in the database. A anyone ever run TFS two 2010 or earlier? All right. I'm s first of all, I'm sorry. I have scars from that myself. Uh, but you may know, you may remember from that that just about everything in that ecosystem got stored in the database. Well, when they decided to run this in the cloud, they wanted to use SQL Azure. And that had caps on how big your database could be. So they had to add some abstractions in there so that they didn't have to store all of your source control in the database. Because you know, that might not be the greatest idea and greatest use of space. So they had uh, to abstract some things away. And TFS 2010 was the first version of that product that had some of the interfaces for them to do that. So that's the first step that made it kind of possible to build a cloud service out of this. So we have, uh, uh, as we get into like fall of 2010, we have this one instance. They called it a scale unit. And it had some app tier layers. It had some, uh, uh, what is it, uh, some job runners, uh, the database, and the blob storage for all of your file system stuff that it needed. Now. It had no concept of like Azure AD or Microsoft accounts, anything like that. Basically, if you set up an account, you got a database that uh, that was your instance. It was all just kind of totally separate from everybody else's instance. That was not going to scale over time, right? We cannot have a single database for every single customer. It just it, cost-wise, it would just kind of go out of control. So they started moving along to become a service. And they had to research a couple different options, and they tried a bunch of different stuff. And basically, they started to add, the first thing they started to add was some multi-tenancy. They added a partition ID to the database. Now, sounds pretty straightforward. But one of the things that was uh, kind of glaring when they got to that point was we had to make sure that all the queries now used partition ID. Otherwise, you were potentially going to have data or queries that were going cross customer, right? Because you can't just, you know, you can't just slap a, a partition ID on, and then when you have queries that might uh, might not have that, now you're going to be pulling back data from customers that it should not be doing because now we have data co-located in the same database. So. 
one of the first things that the, they had to do to kind of prevent that problem is add some tests to make sure that uh, any query had the partition ID in it. And they could do that with a feature in SQL Server where you could uh, assign a partition to a group of files in the file system and then just not bring those files online. So anything that would, have a that would look for the default partition would just fail. And so that gave them a kind of a little capability to kind of watch for that. Once we got the multi-tenancy thing kind of sorted, and you know, partition ID was kind of the, the main part of that. There was a bunch of UI stuff that had to happen as well. But then, was, all right, we, we cannot just live on one instance. We have to start breaking this out into, into multiple instances. And so they created a second scale unit, uh, or second instance. And the first one they called scale unit one, because it was the first. The second one they would created was scale unit two, or I'm sorry, scale unit zero. And that's the unit, that's the instance that the VSTS team used to do their development. So they were using VSTS to build VSTS. And that was their chance to find bugs and things before it rolled out to uh, anybody else. They also needed to break out what they called the shared platform services. That that's the service that handled all of the accounts, identity, licensing profiles. Um, and remember this. Remember shared platform services, SPS. It factors into one of our stories coming up. But they had to break out this service so that it stood separate from all of the instances of TFS that did handled your source control and work items and all that kind of fun stuff. So over time, we get more and more scale units. Eventually, uh, now I believe there's 17 scale units out there that handle a number of different uh, a number of different groups of cl of customers. They also continued to break down the services. We started with this monolith of there was TFS, and that was the application. Today, there are 31 individual services that, have, that they've broken out across 17 scale units. And then the, that shared services platform, they created a second instance of that. So now we have some availability there. So, this has all been evolved over time. This, uh, it wasn't that they went down and architected out one day and said, hey, guess what? We're going to make VSTS a service, and so we need to do all of these things. All of these changes came from pain. We're going we're gonna to talk about a couple of different pain points you know, as, as we move through here. But the, the kind of one of the key takeaways that you're going to hear from anybody who talks about this story, from Buck Hodges, who was in charge of engineering for this, for this effort, uh, down to you know, random guys like me out here sharing the story, is they would do something, get some data, learn from it, and evolve, right? It, was, it, it wasn't we start with a grand plan, and now we get all the way down the line, and, every, and we implemented everything perfectly, and it's all fine. It's we tried something, something hurt, we changed it, we made it better, now we move on to the next thing. So today, now we have a bunch of microservices that look something like this. Yay, fun microservices. <laughs> so today, they consume a bunch of Azure. Now, these numbers are just a little bit old. They're probably about a, a year old. Um, I don't have newer numbers yet. But there's the 31 services. It's deployed into 15 regions in Azure. Uses a lot of cores. Um, now, when this service was first being converted, it, this was Azure v1 days, so it, where we had the web roles and worker roles, and IaaS wasn't really a thing yet in, in Azure. Um, it seems kind of weird when you think back on the history there, but there, there actually was only platform as a service uh, as, as the initial offering there. And so that, that's the platform that uh, VSTS was built out, out on. Lots of Azure databases, lots of, data, lots of large uh, files in those databases, and lots and lots of accounts. Now, they've partitioned these scale units into rings. And they use that for deployments. And uh, I've got a link later on for you. 
If you want to learn a little bit more about how Microsoft deploys VSTS and progresses through the different rings in, in their deployment process, uh, I don't think we'll have time to get into that today. But some of the lessons that we learned kind of coming from that box software, it, run it, starting it as a monolith, first of all, there was no notion of on-call when TFS was being created as a service. We had a bunch of engineers who, were, who were, had experience working in shipping box software to you. You ran it. You reported problems, and they tried to replicate it. Now we're asking these same folks to run a service, keep it available all the time, and let other people depend on it. So there, there's definitely some growing pains as they learn about the on-call, uh, uh, as they learn kind of some of the on-call and, and maintaining a service that's running on over time. And one of, the, one of the things that really came out was trace everything. You want logging everywhere you possibly can. You don't want it on all the time, or some of it, but when you do need to trace a problem or figure out what's going on, especially when it comes into caching, where things can get a little subtle, you want those trace statements. You want that telemetry data telling you what code paths are being followed, what is happening you know, with a, a particular request from a customer. Right? Another thing, TFS 2000, uh, 2010, the APIs were SOAP. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, who here enjoys working with SOAP APIs? Anybody? I, I saw a liar back there. Okay. <laughs> now, honestly, in, in, if, you're, if you're working the full .NET stack, whatever, you never actually interacted necessarily with those SOAP APIs. You used the .NET uh, SDK, and things were just fine. Well, when you're running as a service, and you know, the .NET audience isn't your only audience anymore, you need to have better APIs more consistent APIs, and so they began, the, they be, began migrating to REST APIs for everything. And those REST APIs are no lo were, were no longer in internal implementation detail. They were a public contract, and so consistency became very, very important. One of the other, one of the other kind of major lessons learned as they were, as they were moving from running is that one major instance with scheduled downtime and things like that was that database updates are scary, right? TFS was driven on its database. And so you need to be very, very careful that the app was able to talk to the database, the database was able to respond properly to the application. And what they eventually came down to was a pattern for doing their database updates where the application needs to be able to talk to the current version and a previous version and negotiate that with the database, right? That, and figure out which, which particular interface am I supposed to use. They also realized rollback was not going to be an option. When we make database changes, if something goes wrong, we have to roll forward into the next thing. We're not stopping in restoring old databases and, and trying to bring things back because there's just too much change happening. So everything had to become roll forward. So that's just a little bit of, of kind of, uh, that's kind of a high level, hey, we're taking this box software and we're moving it into the cloud. But there's a couple areas I want to focus on of, of things that uh, were very, very helpful, but came from some pain. So, oh, uh, last but not least, today, TFS and VSTS still share 90% of their code base. The same code that, uh, almost, almost the exact same code that's running in VSTS, every three months or so, uh, they have a checkpoint that they ship as TFS, except for the things that are just you know, cloud specific. There's st so there's still a box software component, and they've made this thing work and, sh and share a significant amount of code. One thing that kind of enables them to, uh, so the, if, you, if you're not familiar with the uh, VSTS cadence, they ship new software every three weeks, uh, and they ship bug fixes and stuff daily, or you know, kind of as they're completed. 
one reason that they can do some of that is they had to, they had to work to get back to working on master. We couldn't have these long running feature branches forever and then and then go through, you know, a month or two of stabilization and integration and that we didn't have those kind of cycles anymore. One of the capabilities that enabled them to to start moving back to everybody commits everyone uh, commits to master are feature flags. So they pick they pick or they not really pick but they needed to use feature flags so that we could do decouple the deployment and exposure of new features. Basically, they want to be able to work on things and expose them when they're ready or expose them when they want to announce them and there's a business reason to do so, not when it's, oh, I could hit the deploy button, right? And we also wanted to, like, for example, in the case, uh, when they were adding support for SSH endpoints for, for Git repositories in VSTS, that wasn't something that they needed to turn on globally. There were a handful of customers who were asking for it, and they were able to turn it on for a particular customer or for a particular group of customers or people who were interested in trying out those new features. And feature flags allowed them to control that re the release of that feature to those where it would matter. It also allows them to keep working on new features and keep them hidden and keep them from impacting the flow of, uh, the flow of code and get that stuff into master so people knew what was changing, they knew where things were going, they knew what was gonna happen. So one of the things that we learned from working with these feature flags, we're back to telemetry is key, tracing is key, right? You, when you turn on a feature, you need to be able to tell what's gonna happen with that code path, right? When we're troubleshooting an issue, we need to know, are people using it, right? We turn this thing on for a bunch of new people and are they actually using that feature? Are we getting the feedback that we need to decide if we want to go wider with it or not? Right? Um, one, of the, one of the great things about feature flags, if something is interacting improperly, you can just turn it off. Right? We turn on, if we put a, feature, uh, put a feature in a production and it starts impacting performance, just turn the thing off. Right? Now, one of, the, uh, one of the things that we have to learn with using feature flags is you can go a little feature flag crazy. You can also go, uh, you can also go a little too crazy on the, we're going to hide everything till the launch day, right? And we're going to turn everything on. Scott Guthrie's going to get up and do a keynote, or Brian Harry's going to get up and do a keynote, and it's all going to be awesome. Yeah. Not quite. So, Connect. Uh, the Connect conference is a developer conference that Microsoft runs. Usually happens in the fall. The Connect 2013 conference, they're going to show this whole slew of new features in VSTS. And they're all hidden behind feature flags. The morning before the conference, they flip them all on. Let's let loose these uh, new features upon the world and promptly take the service down. It became unusable for almost two weeks. Thankfully, for, uh, for the conference, they had t the foresight to take some screenshots and the conference could go on because, you know, conference-driven development and release is, is uh, it's a thing, right? And, um, but it took about two weeks to fully restore service after this. There was a bunch of things that they went and turned off, but there were, there were cascading impacts from this. So that leads to talking a little bit about resilience in the cloud, right? What happens when we turn on all these feature flags and things start to go bad and it takes us weeks to recover? Well, that turning on all the things, one of the, one of the side effects, one of the th things that caused a problem was it exposed a bunch of new services that all communicated into the load balancer uh, and the load balancers ran out of ports. They'd never all been tested together at one time. So all these new features, new portal capabilities, new services, new synchronization services, all that kind of stuff, um, it, it, when they were tested in isolation, they, they didn't cause the threshold to go over. But when they all came on together, 
it caused a, it caused a real problem and caused the whole service to go down. Right? So what are some things that we can do to prevent that? And, and so the VSTS team uh, looked around, saw what people are doing, came up with circuit breakers. Right? I first learned about circuit breakers from uh, Michael Nygaard's book, Release It. It's been an absolute favorite of mine. New version, just uh, uh, second edition just came out. Uh, if you have not read it, I strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, but circuit breakers basically give you the option to, hey, when just like in an electrical system, if things are, uh, if we're experiencing higher load than we expect, just stop, fail, right? And that can prevent impro uh, an improper amount of load on a downstream system. So we have what a circuit breaker might look like. But circuit breaker, just by putting in a circuit breaker pattern, does not fix the problem in and of itself. Right? You still have to write the code to make this thing degrade gracefully. You still have to make it handle the error condition that when my downstream service is not available, I can respond properly. We also have to learn what unhealthy or at risk looks like to trigger that circuit breaker, right? You're going to start with some magic number that you kind of pull out from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, your scientific wild, uh, wild butt guest or uh, some other technical way of determining that. But then you need to be able to tune those things in production. You need to be able to adjust those based on the realities of how your service operates. The other thing that, uh, that you're going to bump into or could potentially bump into is retries, right? So I have my circuit breaker. It throws, starts, starts failing. I have a client that wants to do something. It starts queuing up retries. The minute my circuit breaker flips back on, am I going to have a bunch of clients all hammering this thing and then, again, overloading the circuit and popping it again? We need to make sure that when our, uh, that our downstream clients are also well behaved and can abandon and come back or, and you know, either have a back off or be able to come back and retry things. So, example of this. Visual Studio 2013 added a seemingly innocuous feature, the ability to synchronize your settings. So if you were using Visual Studio on multiple machines, you check this little box, and guess what? All your settings would just magically migrate from machine to machine. It used the SPS service, that shared platform services that I mentioned earlier, that was responsible for account, identity, and some uh, licensing, you know, some of those core services. Well, at the time, it, you, it, when we wanted to implement the synchronized settings, guess what? SPS was a handy place to do it because that's where your account lived. So what happened when this feature was released out into the wild? Visual Studio requested that uh, notification from SPS that, uh, uh, and it creates a subscription in a service bus. Normally, in all the testing, that was a quick call. It would, it would return right away, but it started to slow down with the volume of requests that were coming in. And all of these calls were being made on the thread pool. We ran out of threads because calls weren't returning fast enough. Requests start queuing up. And the SPS service becomes unavailable. Little problem with that. Nobody can log in anymore. So our seemingly innocuous synchronized settings service has just disabled the ability of anybody to use VSTS in any meaningful way. And because the client didn't know to back off when things weren't working well, the minute you were able to get some breathing room, all of a sudden more clients would come and start hammering the service again. So even if there was a circuit breaker in a kind of a mid-tier that would help prevent and protect that SPS service, the client was hammering away. And how about a hand for our organizers for making sure that they took care of us first? All right.
All right, welcome back. Uh, it seems like the weather does not like the VSTS story, but I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> so welcome back. Where we left off before we were so rudely interrupted was uh, we were talking about shared, uh, uh, the shared service uh, pr platform and how it was getting hammered by the synchronized settings and preventing people from logging in and doing anything else reasonable with, with Visual Studio. So, uh, or with Visual Studio Team Services. So, basically what we had was this cascading failure from a low priority feature, something that really didn't make a whole lot of difference and probably should have handled it better, that blocked critical behaviors like login <laughs> um, and the retry component of that service, which is meant to make it more robust actually damage the system more, right? So when we, when we look at implementing circuit breakers or, an, or any other kind of back off or retry feature where we want to protect downstream resources, we have to make sure that our client libraries, our client use, uh, the, the client utilization of those things understands that, hey, things are going to fail. Retry, OK but then back off and forget about it. Give it, chance, give it a chance to recover. Because if we don't provide that capability all the way down the stack, we just are, we're setting ourselves up to kind of DDoS ourselves. And that, that's really what it is, right? You had Visual Studio, the, uh, the IDE, DDoSing VSTS the service. So, <laughs> Circuit breakers, I love them, love the concept. But they do require some care and feeding. They do require some, uh, they do require some operational rigor about how we implement them, how we maintain them, right? They're not just to set it and forget it. We need to verify that when we have that circuit breaker that we're gonna fall back to a good behavior when things recover, when it's safe to recover them, right? If the circuit never recovers, covers, we just have an outage. We just have failure. We just have failure in a different spot, right? The other thing is, is where the circuit breaker blows up is not the problem that we have. Something else is the problem, right? That's just a symptom. That is just a, hey, we put this catch in place so that it, we would prevent worse things from happening. But something else is driving that problem. It, it's the, you know, there's, some, there's something other than the fact that our circuit breaker tripped, that's the problem. And this is where that tracing and that telemetry come back, right? I said from the very first part of this talk, one of the most important things that we had to do was imp implement some tracing and telemetry, right? How do we figure out what went wrong? We need that information. When you're debugging a service, when it's multiple instances and it's spread across a number of things and there's, there's many, many users hitting this thing, there are a lot of different code paths that could be taken to impact things. There are, there are a lot of different functions and bits of code that are running. There are a lot of different services that we're interacting with. And being able to find what the paths are that are causing the problems is absolutely critical. So I mentioned early on that when uh, TFS was first being rolled out as a service, as VSTS, that there was no concept of on-call, that, that we had a, a bunch of folks who were used to shipping box software who are now, hey, guess what? You're running a service, guys and gals. Let's make it awesome. Eventually, we had to uh, implement some kind of on-call behavior, right? And uh, I noticed on Twitter during our, our unscheduled break that uh, somebody recognized some of the artwork. Uh, a hat tip to uh, Ashley McNamara, who's uh, drawn our lovely, our, uh, our bit. He, uh, the raccoon there, his name is Bit. He is the mascot of our cloud developer advocacy team. And so where you see my coworkers around, you'll find, you'll find him. Uh, but sh she's done some awesome artwork. I have no art skills, so I could approach nothing near this. But in reality, when you run a service, you have to have some 
kind of on call. You have to have some kind of on call. You have to have some kind of incident response. It might, it might be totally ad hoc at first because you didn't really know what to expect. So over time, the VSTS team has kind of evolved their on-call behavior and and what their uh, what their what their operational pattern is like. So we have an improperly formatted slide. Um, <laughs> so we have it, we have our engineers, we have our software developers, and they are responsible for the code that they ship. All that tracing and logging that I was talking about. When there are errors, we know who shipped the bug. So we can go back and get their help fixing that thing. Because we know who changed what lines of code when. Right? So what we have feature teams in Visual Studio Team Services. There's 10 engineers to a team. And uh, those 10 engineers will have a couple of people designated to be responsible for on-call stuff. Right, so we have a designated responsible individual from each feature team, and they are the ones that are on call. That ro they rotate over a period of time. Uh, you might have a couple people rotating every couple hour, or every twelve hours. Then you have multiple people rotating weekly, and their responsibility is the the proper running of our systems. They are dealing with the incident, uh, with, the, with the triggers from monitoring that show problems before they even come up from customers. Or when we have a customer facing issue, they're responsible for responding to that. Because production is an important environment, they actually have to access production through a dedicated machine that has nothing installed but the, but the tools to get into production. All right, so you can't just randomly you know, uh, SSH or RDP into production. We also have SRE teams. And they're responsible for general platform issues, again, accessing production through a secure laptop. And then they perform tasks that have yet to be automated and work on automating those things, and again, in furtherance of the platform. You'll notice the SREs are not the ones on call for feature issues. The engineers who ship the features are responsible for how they run in production. That gives them a, a and that gives them incentive to have good telemetry and tracing so that they can troubleshoot these things when they happen when the, when bad things happen in production. It gives them a good amount of incentive to to very well test the features before they ship them. And it gives them it gives them incentives for designing operability into the platform. Each of the feature teams I mentioned, uh, that we have the teams of 10. Two engineers for each sprint are designated to be the shield members, and they handle all the interruptions. So you have eight engineers who are working on new feature work or bugs. Uh, each feature team has a bug cap as well. And right now, the bug cap's at five bugs per engineer. Uh, that number was randomly pulled so that from the idea that you can do a bug a day, and we want to be able to ship within a week. And so if we wanted you to uh, clear off all the bugs from your thing, we could, get you, we could get done in a week. But the bug cap is five per engineer. And so the other eight folks are working on their bugs or their features. And we've got the two folks who get to work on feature stuff unless there's interruptions, unless there's live site issues, unless there's interactions that need to happen with other teams. And this job responsibility rotates every sprint. So not the same people aren't constantly being hammered with that, with that duty, right? So everyone has a chance to work uninterrupted. Another thing that is not been traditional in the Microsoft ecosystem is transparency, right? Uh, there are public postmortems for customer-facing issues in VSTS. Uh, they get written up on either Brian Harry's blog or uh, Buck Hodges, but they are publicly shared. 
real deep technical detail as far as what happened, when it happened, um, what, the, what the corrective actions that they're going to take are going to be. And this is something that we haven't really seen a lot from a ton of, of services at Microsoft, is that, that public-facing public admission, hey, something went wrong. This is what we're going to do to fix it. But so many people rely on VSTS as a part of their critical process to deploy, build and deploy their software, that this is a critical part in building trust with the community. And uh, you know, it, it's, again, it, it's one of the things I love about VSTS as a cloud service being operated, not necessarily about their feature set, but just about how they, how they operate and how they share things. The last thing I want to touch on today uh, with how v the VSTS team operates and has moved into being cloud service is how they approach testing. Testing is near and dear to my heart, infrastructure testing especially. You know, uh, having, having worked at, at Chef on tools like Test Kitchen and uh, uh, worked with Pester as a test runner in PowerShell and all sorts of fun stuff like that, I love the concept of automated tests. Well, the VSTS and TFS team started with, they had a nightly test run and a full automation test run. And, you know, not so great in the terms of fast feedback, right? The nightly test run took 22 hours. That meant you get two hours a day of, <laughs> of, of cycle time there. Um, not so great for, in terms of feedback. And the full run would take two days. It means you, could, you eat the whole weekend to run a full automation test run. That's not tenable. That is not, if we want to ship a service and we want to ship frequently so we can get bug fixes out right away, we want to ship new features every three weeks, we can't spend a day or two days for test runs. Too much change gets batched up into that. Right? We want to ship small batches. Small batches require fast tests so that we can get that feedback right away. So we define some new testing principles. There's a focus on writing tests at the lowest level possible so that they're the fastest that they could possibly be. Our unit tests were supposed to be super fast, right? They, these tests needed to be able to run anywhere. Yes, oh, five minutes, awesome. We are right on time. Now, tests were treated as production code. These things are important because they are what help ensure the reliability and the quality of the system, right? And if, so if there's flaky tests, I've written a flaky test or two in my time. Um, if there's flaky tests, they get fixed or they get dropped. Flaky tests provide n very little value and actually are actively harmful because they help tune you out from test failures. Like, oh yeah, it's that test, it fails all the time, right? Now we start becoming a little more acceptable of red in our build. We don't want that. If it's something that needs to be tested, we need to find a way to test it reliably, or we need to refactor our software to support a reliable test. One of the things that happened too during this time frame of the uh, TFS to VSTS kind of transformation is Microsoft restructured how they do engineering. And before they had, uh, they had an, uh, a software engineering position, and then they had a software engineering in test. And so they had test, uh, professional testers. That went away. They all just became engineers. So the people who built the features are responsible for the tests for those features. That you couldn't punt and say, oh, yeah, well, testers will catch that. That saves manual testing efforts for fun exploratory stuff, you know, finding the weird things that users are going to go do in unexpected ways, right? All the happy path and our expected bad paths should be covered by tests, our, our automated tests. So we have unit tests, and they classified those as level zero or level one, and these are the things we want to run really, really fast. There are 60,000, or actually now I think we're closer to 70,000 unit tests that run in about six or seven minutes, right? And uh, those tests 
run across every check-in. And, and because it's a short time frame, it's, because it's six, seven minutes, you get fast feedback on your, on, on your change, and we can focus on small batches. More periodically, we run the longer tests. We have some functional tests that cover those scenarios that the unit test just can't quite cover. Right? And some tests require that full, de uh, full deployment of the software to actually, to actually test against. Right? And because we're operating as a service, you cannot test every scenario in an isolated fashion. So, so we, have to have a, uh, we have to have a category for those, but those are the fewest number of tests that you have. And they issued some guidance, right? We, that your unit tests cannot take longer than two seconds per test, right? Uh, we've got some averages and times. We can run however many, blah, blah, blah. We want to get, there's a constant focus on driving down that time to feedback. Because we can scale out to multiple builders, tests that we can parallelize are awesome. But we also need to make sure that each individual test is very, very fast. So just to kind of quickly recap, in our VST, TFS to VSTS migration, we moved from box software that was in, designed to be installed on a single server or a couple of servers in your environment to a cloud-hosted, multi-tenant, multi-instance service. We use feature flags to control the release of features into production and turn off things that might be bad actors. We also use that to keep our, uh, to keep our developers committing to master and keep feature branches very short-lived. We use circuit breaker and other patterns to provide resiliency across the stack so that we protect critical behaviors like login. We have a live site culture, including site reliability engineering and developers supporting the code that they've written. And we really focus on testing. Tests keep the bar high for the qual of the code that we ship. Really? <sighs> so, all right, if, if we have to evacuate, before we evacuate, again. <laughs> yeah, so we can, there's a lot more to this story than I've been able to share. And if you, if you have your phone and you want to grab this link, there's the VSTS DevOps story at aka.ms. There are a number of articles and videos that dive deeper into the different things that we've done to, to operationalize VSTS and how, we, and how we do DevOps efforts at Microsoft. There are some wonderful stories there. I'll leave this up for one more second. And see, camera's up. If you also search for uh, DevOps at my, or how Microsoft does DevOps, you'll find this stuff as well. And you can find some more from me at my blog, stephenmorowski.com. My team is at aka.ms, the league. And the rest of the Azure advocates, you'll find us at developers.microsoft.com. Um, if you want to know more about the league thing, um, that's a, a funny story, and I'm happy to share it out in the hallway. Thank you very much. I so appreciate your time and attention and your willingness to come back after we had a little bit of weather. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the open spaces. So if, if any of the stuff I've been talking about sounds interesting, let's talk about it some more in open spaces.